Okay, everybody, so here's a presentation from Connor Ganley and Nathaniel Stone, and it's the energy audit of the JMU bookstore, so enjoy. Hello, everyone. I'm Connor. And I'm Nathan Stone. And I'd like to start off by saying welcome to the presentation of our senior capstone project, and thank you all for uh, taking the time out of your day to come see us. We worked very hard on this project over the past year, and we hope you guys enjoy what we have prepared for you today. So, as he said, we did an energy audit of the Jamie Bookstore. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the building uh, down by Godwin Hall. Uh, this is a commercial building. We thought it was a perfect size to analyze. Uh, it wasn't too big, wasn't too small as far as the uh, buildings on campus go. Um, so, the scope of our project consisted of uh, analyzing the energy efficiency of the bookstore. An energy audit is basically where you uh, figure out the energy use for a year and see what types of improvements can be made to increase that efficiency and in the end save the owner uh, money in the long run. Uh, this audit consists of four uh, detailed levels, each one a little bit more complicated than the previous. Uh, it starts with just looking at the energy consumption for a year and seeing how it compares to other buildings of similar size. And then it works its way up to uh, creating virtual models of the building using different softwares. Uh, we use BOPT and EQUEST. BOPT is Building Energy Optimization, and EQUEST is Quick Energy Simulation Tool. Finally, we wanted to calculate the UA value of the building and estimate the total energy load, uh, which is basically uh, for space heating and space cooling. Uh, these take up the most energy uh, by far compared to anything that could be plugged in, such as lights or computers or electronics. And with all the data that we collected, we wanted to make some recommendations in the end to improve that overall efficiency. <clears throat> okay, so the first stage of our energy audit was the benchmarking stage. Uh, this is pretty much where we compare the building's energy usage to other buildings of similar shape, size, and that are located in similar climates. Uh, this is actually where we ran into our first problem for the audit. Uh, this is because in order to do the stage, you need the energy consumption data just for the bookstore in order to compare it to other buildings. But the submeter that collected the energy consumption data uh, was actually attached to multiple other buildings on campus. So we are only able to get the data for the collection of those buildings and nothing individually for the bookstore, but we're able to overcome this problem uh, through the data that we were gave, gathered in the later stages. <clears throat> okay, so the next stage uh, was a preliminary audit. Uh, this is basically where we just conducted an initial walkthrough of the bookstore um, in order to identify any low-hanging fruit or obvious um, energy inefficiency problems that could be easily fixed. Uh, this is an image that we took with a thermal camera of a leak we found in the back corner of the bookstore. Um, so this could be easily fixed with just some insulation put on. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> and the next stage was the standard audit stage. This was the most data collection intense part of our project. Uh, we went to facilities management and uh, they actually gave us access to the actual blueprints of the bookstore. So we were able to collect uh, HVAC data, um, building materials and dimensions, stuff like that. Um, another part of this stage was finding out the R value of the walls and the U factor of the windows. Uh, for those of you that, um, that don't know, in simple terms, that's just how easily heat energy goes in between the windows and the walls. And uh, the last part of this step that we actually didn't get to do um, is the negative pressure test. The reason why we weren't able to do it is because the building was so big. But uh, just to give you guys an idea of what it is, pretty much you take a big fan, stick it at the front door of the building, and seal the whole building off and turn on the fan. So it sucks all the air off. And um, after that, the building's negatively pressurized. And once that's done, you can go in the building with a thermal camera. And the, since, it's neg since it's under negative pressure, the air will be rushing in through the leaks. And you'll, you'll be able to identify that with a thermal camera because there's going to be a temperature difference. <clears throat> and the uh, last stage was the simulation stage of the audit. This is where we use all the data that we've gathered up till this point, and um, we put it into programs. The two that we used were energy modeling software is called EQuest and Beopt. And what those programs do is they take the data that you've given them and they spit out pretty much virtual models of the energy consumption over time. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into a little more detail on the uh, walkthrough stage of our energy audit. So, one big part of the walkthrough stage is you go in the building and you identify anything other than like spacing and cooling that's taking up energy. So for the bookstore, um, the two main <coughs> energy consumption things that we spotted were uh, the lights and the computer usage. We got 
around 700 to 20 lights in the bookstore total, so that's a lot of light bulbs. Um, right now, the majority are fluorescent lights, uh, and so one of the first recommendations we were gonna make to the bookstore was to replace them with LEDs, but uh, we actually found out that they're already doing that, so as the fluorescent bulbs go out, instead of replacing them with the same ones, they actually put in more efficient LEDs, and as you can see, they take up less power. The LEDs take up 30 watts, whereas the uh, fluorescent tubes take up 34 watts. And uh, the LEDs output more light for less energy, so that's good. Um, another big culprit of energy use was uh, the computers that are on all the time. So I'm sure most of you guys have been to the bookstore. Uh, they've got the Mac <coughs> displays up on the top floor. So that's, yeah, that's just a bunch of computers that are always on. Um, and also the other computers at the register and for the other employees. Um, another recommendation that we made to the bookstore was to, you know, have those computers on a timer so that they turn off at night and they're not taking up as much energy. And some other miscellaneous items that were uh, taking up energy were two vending machines in the back and there's also a water cooler. <clears throat> so now I'm just going to show you guys some images that we took with a thermal camera of stuff that we found during the walkthrough. So this is an image of a heat leak that we found under the front door. Um, as you can see, there's a big draft going on right there. This could probably be easily fixed. <coughs> you know, if you just put like a little plastic flap just to completely seal that area off, that leak would probably be taken care of. And so the top left image, uh, that's another image of a different back corner. And this is unexpected, but we found that the majority of the corners in the bookstore, they just have a big area of um, heat leaks going through. So if we could insulate all of those corners, that would probably save a lot of energy. And uh, finally, on the bottom right, that's just uh, an image showing you guys how the thermal camera works. Um, that's an induction box, like the ones you see up here. And right now, it's just supplying uh, cool air to the building. So now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on the second level of this energy audit, the survey and analysis. <coughs> Uh, like you said, this is where we collected most of the data. Uh, it took probably the most time throughout the whole process because this data collection required us to leave our equipment there overnight sometimes and sometimes for like a week at a time. Um, the main goal of this stage was to calculate the R value uh, of the different layers of the building, the different uh, windows and the wall materials. Um, the R value is basically the thermal resistance of the building or of the material, sorry, so that uh, it's how well uh, heat is, or the material resists heat flowing through it. And uh, inversely, the U factor is uh, it's the opposite of the R value. So instead of how well it resists heat transfer, it's uh, how well it transmits heat through the wall. So uh, in this first diagram, you can see what we call one dimensional heat transfer. Uh, Q represents the heat going from one side of the wall to the other. And T1 and T2 represents the temperature difference uh, between the inside and the outside. Uh, for those of you that don't know, heat flows from hot to cold, not cold to hot. Um, in the picture on the right, uh, you can see this red hockey puck looking thing. That is our heat flux sensor. And these two thermocouples uh, measure the temperature. The first one is taped down to the glass to measure the surface temperature of a glass on the inside. And the second one, it's kind of hard to see, but it's actually hanging free in the air to measure the air temperature on the inside. And we also had a similar device that we put on the outside of the window to measure the surface temperature on the outside as well as the air temperature out there. Uh, these are a few pictures from the first couple days of our data collection. Uh, this is setting up the outside sensor for the two temperatures. Uh, this is Dr. Chen showing us how the equipment worked in the first place uh, on the first day. And then this is on the right is after we uh, figured out how to set up the data logger and the computer all on our own so that we could come back to the bookstore without Dr. Chen's help to collect more data. Uh, this is our first set of data from that upstairs window that you just saw. Um, you can see the five columns uh, going throughout the day. The first one is the heat flux and then the four different temperatures. Uh, I'll gonna, I'm going to blow up this graph. Uh, the R value is calculated up here. But as you can see through the graph, uh, the heat flux and the temperature uh, vary throughout the day quite a bit. This spike at about 6 a.m. is when the sun comes up. So that window is on the east wall. And when the sun is shining directly on it, the temperature is obviously going to go up. Uh, but we wanted to isolate our data to a time of what's called quasi-steady state, where heat flux is relatively constant and the temperature uh, remains relatively the same throughout that time, uh, which was midnight to 6 a.m., uh, where there was no spike in temperature. Our R value we calculated to be 1.87. So typically, for a double pane window, you see an R value of 2. 
Uh, we thought this was pretty close to two. Uh, our uncertainty is 0.03. That's just natural uncertainty in the measurement itself. Um, but we thought we could get closer to two, and we thought it might be a little bit low because the window was able to be open, so there was a slight draft right next to our equipment. So we then moved to the downstairs window, uh, one that was just sealed off that couldn't be open, so there was no draft. And we calculated this one to be 1.98, which is a lot closer to two. So we figured out that our data collection techniques were actually working and accurate. Next, we moved on to the wall uh, from one of the offices to the outside, so the drywall uh, all the way outside through the brick. And typically, you see an R value of about 15 for a building like this uh, for that wall, but ours was a little bit low, 8.28. And we think this was because uh, with the one-dimensional heat transfer, it ignores the lateral heat transfer through the wall. And when we went to the outside to put our data collector out there, we couldn't find the exact spot uh, compared to the inside where our equipment was, so we think we lost some of that heat due to that lateral heat transfer. I'll try not to bore you guys all with uh, these data sheets. But uh, finally, we went to, went to the workroom floor. Uh, this was just a concrete slab in the back room, and there was no crawl space under the building, so it was just in direct contact with the earth. Uh, so we expected there to be very little heat loss through the floor, uh, which is why our R value is so high of 40.05. Um, and this is our last uh, setup by the front door. We had one on this inside layer and then the outside one was on that uh, second layer of the outside door. Uh, you can see our heat flux sensor right here, thermocouple measuring the glass temperature, and then the other one is down here hanging off measuring the inside air temperature. Here's the glass door. Uh, it was a little bit lower than the wall, but definitely higher than the windows, uh, 5.56. And from all these values, we could calculate the total U factor. The R value is a measure of the, uh, the different materials, uh, how the heat flows through conduction, but the U factor is how, uh, how well the heat transmits the building from one air layer to the other through conduction and convection. Next, we wanted to gather information about the HVAC system, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, for those who don't know. Uh, this is me attaching one of our sensors to these induction boxes up here. Um, we had to attach one to there to get the uh, return temperature of the whole system, and the other one we put inside the air conditioning unit to get the temperature of the air being supplied to the whole building. Uh, this is the data we collected over five days. It varies quite a bit also, but as you can see in these uh, shark fin looking spots. Uh, that's where the boiler was turned on at 11 p.m. every night uh, and it stays on until about 5 a.m. and then turns off. Uh, they do this so that when they open up in the morning the building is not really cold from the air outside or hot for example in some places uh, in this case would be cold. Um, next graph is just uh, the last day of the data collection. The green line is the outside ambient temperature. Uh, and from this data, we could calculate the total UA value of the building, which is the U factor of all the different materials uh, multiplied by the total square footage or the area of the building itself. So here's the formula for the UA value. Um, density, this first term is uh, the density of the air itself. V dot is the volumetric flow rate of the air being supplied to the building, which is about 30,000 cubic feet per minute. CP is the specific heat of the air, which is just a property of the air itself. And then this first delta T is the difference in temperature between the return and the supply of the HVAC system. Uh, this big T difference down here is the temperature difference between uh, the inside and the outside air. And the little t's are the time that the uh, system was on and off, so the total time that it was running. Uh, so with all of these, we calculated the UA value to be roughly 6,200 BTUs per hour per degree Fahrenheit. To put this in some perspective, a 2,000 square foot house uses about 450. Uh, this is much bigger, but this building is a total of about 30,000 square feet. Uh, next, we want to calculate the space heating and cooling loads from that total UA value. Um, so we gathered weather data for the heating degree days and cooling degree days which is basically the average amount of degrees above or below a certain base temperature of 65 degrees. That's just an agreed upon uh, base for like human comfort. Uh, so on the next page, you can see that in the uh, summer months, it was below that base temp, or sorry, it was above that base temperature, so the building needed to be cooled. 
and for the rest of the year it was uh, typically below that, so it needed to be heated. And all this uh, data was from 2015. That was the most recent year of data that we have available. Uh, you can get that on multiple weather websites uh, depending on the area that you're in. So next, uh, this is another property of the window, the solar heat gain coefficient. Uh, this is how, how much heat gets trapped by the window uh, from the outside. So it's basically just the ratio of how much is inside versus how much is hitting the window from the outside. Um, in Vermont, for example, where it's cold for most of the year, you want a high heat gain coefficient because you want to trap as much heat as possible so you don't have to use as much energy. And vice versa in Florida, where it's hot for most of the year, uh, you want a low heat gain coefficient because you don't want to be adding all that extra heat to your house. So in the mid-Atlantic, we're about halfway in between both of those. Uh, so our heat gain was about 50%, so half the heat gets trapped by the window on the inside. Next, another property of the window was the uh, visible transmittance. So it's similar to the heat gain, but instead of the heat that's getting trapped, it's actually the visible light that makes it through the whole window. And we calculated this ratio to be uh, 0.63, so roughly 63% of the visible light uh, makes it through the windows. And this was all the data that we collected from this. We got a, uh, a good idea of the whole building envelope and how much uh, space heating and cooling it used. And from there, we could move on to the simulation stage. All right, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the last stage of the energy audit. If you want to go to the next slide. OK, so the first program we used for this stage was BOPT. Um, this stands for Building Energy Optimization Kit. Uh, it's an energy modeling software that pretty much uh, it uses yeah, all the data that we have gathered up to this point. We put it into the program, and it's able to give us a virtual model of the building, as well as simulate its energy consumption over the course of time. Um, one of the, so this program was originally designed for residential buildings, um, not, not designed for anything you know up to the size of the industrial building like the bookstore. But the main reason we still decided to stick with the program is because the way that the software is designed it makes it really easy to compare different energy consumption scenarios against each other at the same time. I'll show you more about that later. Okay, so this is a screenshot from the uh, first stage of the BOP program. This is where we're giving it data about the building footprint. So we, for this stage, we put in uh, the square footage of the building, its shape, um, how many floors there are, the height of each floor, um, the ceiling, what it's made out of, and uh, like what angle it's at. Um, yeah, so pretty much this is just building the outer skeleton of the building. And uh, so this next stage is where, since we've already developed the outside of the building, we have to go and do all the stuff that's on the inside. So this is uh, where we're inputting data that's going to affect the majority of the uh, energy consumption data from the simulation. So as you can see, we got a bunch of different options, everything from what the walls are made out of, the types of windows, um, the water heater, um, the screen that's open right now, this is where I'm selecting what kind of boiler the building uses for the space conditioning, and it uses a gas one. So this data is, is gonna have the greatest impact on the results of the energy simulation. Okay, and this is a screenshot from the last stage of BOPT uh, from the results page after we ran the simulation. Uh, this graph shows energy use um, from the site over the course of a year and millions of BTUs. And this is getting into what I was talking about earlier, how you're able to compare different energy usage scenarios. So the one on the left, um, that is the B10 benchmark. And that's, um, this simulation data is based off of pretty much just a default building that comes with the program. So, and they give you that just so you have a baseline comparison for your projects. Um, the column in the middle, this is the simulation data based off of um, what the bookstore, what state the bookstore is currently in. So everything we got from the blueprints and all the values that we got from uh, taking the measurements of the bookstore. And finally, the column on the right is um, simulation data that's based off of improvements that I've, uh, potential improvements that I made to the bookstore in the program. So I was able to upgrade the windows, um, increase insulation on the walls, stuff like that. And as you can see, the energy consumption went down over the course of a year. So while he was spending most of his time on BOPT, I was running eQuest, Quick Energy Simulation Tool. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than BOPT, uh, and it can be applied to uh, buildings of any size. Uh, this kind of looks like a house, but it's actually a commercial building. Uh, it's similar to the bookstore in shape and size. The doors and windows are all uh, the measured value, or the measured sizes that uh, 
I got from field work out there. Uh, the only thing that's missing is the columns, uh, but they don't take up any heat or space, space heating or cooling, so I didn't feel the need to include them. Um, so this is one of the input stages uh, for eQuest. You can see uh, the different ceiling materials, the vertical walls and the floors, uh, what the slab is like, how thick it is. Um, and this is screen four of 26. Uh, this is just one of the multiple wizards. This is the uh, detailed design wizard. Um, and it goes through very, in, in very depth, uh, or very heavy detail of uh, everything that's included in the building as far as what types of lights, uh, how many skylights, what percentage of the area contributes to uh, office space or restrooms or uh, one of them was a smoking lounge, but we didn't have that, uh, for example. Um, these red inputs are the ones that we inputted in on our own. The green ones are the defaults, and we actually found that uh, most of these defaults did apply to our building for some of the simpler uh, inputs. So this is the output screen. Uh, on the left, you can see the electricity consumption in kilowatt hours for a whole year, and then gas consumption on the right. Uh, this, we don't have our total value on here, but it was about 800 uh, million BTUs per year, uh, which is what we calculated from the uh, UA value earlier in the process. And another cool feature of eQuest is that you can make uh, slight changes similar to Bopt and see how much you can save uh, over the course of time. So this blue line or purple line is the first change I made and that was just adding a different insulation or adding some to the corners, for example. Uh, and that could save up to 1200 even close to $1,500 over the course of 25 years, uh, which is a long time, but a few thousands of dollars is actually a lot of money. Uh, the second one that we made was the thermostat management. So in the heating and cooling seasons, there are two set points for each uh, when the building uh, or the system needs to kick on to cool the building or heat it. And I actually changed the set point by only one degree for each of them. And this curve shows that it could save up to $2,500 uh, over the course of uh, 25 years. So about $100 a year just by changing the thermostat one degree. Finally, with all this data, uh, we have some conclusions and recommendations. Like I said, changing the thermostat set point was a big one. $100 for one degree is a significant change uh, compared to a very slight change in human comfort level in the building. Uh, continuing to replace the burnt out lights with more efficient LEDs uh, as they're doing. Uh, you don't have to take them all out at once and replace the LEDs because that would be a heavy uh, capital investment. Uh, so they're actually doing the most efficient process by replacing them <coughs> as they burn out. Excuse me. Uh, Finally, insulating the spots where that thermal leakage is present. Uh, most of the corners, if not all of them, have a heavy area of blue under the thermal imaging. Uh, so just going in there and shoving insulation in can uh, reduce the space heating significantly. Finally, the last one goes back to the very first stage of the energy audit where we couldn't get the data from the submeter uh, because there really was none for the, uh, the bookstore itself. It was just a collaboration of all the buildings in the area. So getting a submeter on there and getting the individual data is very important uh, for this energy audit and actually seeing how it compares uh, as compared to like just building it in models because they weren't completely accurate even though they were very close to it from the blueprints that we got. All right, yeah, and we'd uh, like to thank Dr. Chen over here uh, for advising us throughout the course of the project, a lot of help. Um, we'd also like to thank Abe Kaufman and Mike Domelian from Facilities Management for giving us access to the blueprints. Uh, Chris, the bookstore manager, for helping us uh, set up equipment, you know, where areas employees and stuff were only allowed. Uh, that was helpful. And also finally, uh, friends and family for supporting us throughout this endeavor. Thanks guys. Thank you guys for being here today. Any other questions? Based on this, the final like uh, conclusion and maybe suggestions you made to the bookstore, what are they feasibly able to do and what do they plan on doing, I guess? Uh, the first thing that they're doing, in, they're in the process of getting that sub meter on. Uh, they're trying to do that for all the buildings on campus so that they can analyze all the individual uh, usages for each building. Uh, as far as insulation goes, that would require a slightly big uh, 
construction project to insulate all the corners. Uh, and, but the bookstore, I think, is closed for a period in the summer so that they could do that. It doesn't take that long. Um, the other ones, replacing the lighting, that one's easy, uh, as you can imagine, and then setting the computers on timers so that they're not running all night. Uh, they said that they turn them off if people remember, but they don't always remember, so that's a significant uh, electricity load. Um, what do you think was one of the biggest challenges you had, um, whether it was data during data collection or working with the bookstore um, throughout this project? Uh, I think the virtual software was pretty complicated. Yeah, we had to, for eQuest, we had to sign up for online training uh, where there was a bunch of different courses and it was very detailed. Uh, a lot of the training videos <coughs> didn't apply that much to the bookstore, so we kind of had to figure it out on our own based on the data that we had. Uh, so that the data collection itself took up most of the time uh, just because we had to leave stuff there, but the virtual software equipment took up uh, most of our brain power pretty much. Thank you guys again very much.